Uh, I want to talk about consumer products and some specific uh, challenges that I've seen in our customers uh, who are operating in this particular industry. And uh, some of the things that are especially uh, unique to the consumer products industries is, first of all, um, highly compressed development cycles. Uh, it, it really just astounds me sometimes uh, to watch how quickly uh, you guys have to turn around brand new products and you know come out with a new make and model every single year. Uh, we have customers that are especially in the, uh, the field of, of baby products, baby care products, uh, as well as uh, consumer appliances and things like that. And uh, you know those very highly competitive uh, for shelf space, for retail space, uh, and having to turn out new ideas and, all, and always uh, you know look like. Uh, you've, you've got some new innovations, which you know often you do. Uh, so that's always a challenge, and that gets coupled then uh, with price pressure. Um, unfortunately, unlike most uh, commercial markets where you can um, you know you can charge people what it costs you to make it, um, you get yes. more driven by by the, the perception of value from the consumer, and uh, you're relying hopefully on a, enough volume to, to make up those costs, uh, but definitely uh, very high price pressure from consumers. Um, you know, not necessarily going to pay uh, twice as much money for something that's twice as good. Uh, you know, maybe you can get another 10% out of them for something that's twice as good. Uh, so, so that creates some, some special challenges. Um, speaking of consumers, um, you know, it would be a great job if it weren't all the, for all the customers, right? <laughs> Um, you've got the, the human factors in perception of quality and most consumer products are going to directly interact with human beings. Um, again, unlike a lot of other industries where you have a piece of equipment uh, that only interacts with other pieces of equipment. Uh, so that creates some unique challenges uh, both in just uh, the perception, uh, the styling, uh, as well as uh, you know, the obvious human interface. Uh, kinds of problems that you have with with any kind of handheld device or or something that has some uh, some ergonomic factors that need to be considered. Uh, so that presents some special challenges. And finally, the, the last challenge uh, is one of reliability and liability. Uh, again, uh, you know, to contrast against other uh, commercial endeavors where you might have uh, people. You know, operating equipment the way it's supposed to be operated, <laughs> and maintaining it according to the required maintenance schedules, and being trained on how to use it. Um, you know, you can you can pretty much rely on your products being heavily abused uh, out in the field um, by consumers. Uh, so, you know, all you need is something that that looks great, everybody likes, costs nothing, and uh, and performs a, a marvelously. Uh, once every three to twelve months, right? <laughs> no problem, no problem. Um, so uh, you need some good tools, and I want to take you through some tools, techniques, functionality today. Uh, we're going to be talking mostly about SolidWorks and SolidWorks products, uh, and we're going to dive into this development cycle here. Um, and uh, this this actually comes to me from uh, a colleague that I met at a re recent conference. Uh, his name is Laurent Agarza. And uh, he, he provided me these beautiful images and, and kind of mapped this out in a way that I really liked and I wanted to echo that with you guys today. Um, taking us through this, this map of how a product comes to life, uh, over on the left-hand side here, uh, is, this is where the brain kicks in. This is where, where ideas are born. And this is really where, where the artists and uh, the industrial designers thrive. Uh, and you know, perhaps the best tools there will forever be uh, you know the same traditional media that, that human beings have been using for the last thousand years of, of paint and pencil and pastels and things like that. More and more, that's gravitating into a digital environment. Um, but still, just the free flow of ideas onto paper, if you will. Uh, and then all the way at the far right, you've got reality. Uh, when a part has to come to production, it can't just look good, it can't just feel good. Um, but it actually has to work. It has to be made out of real metal and real plastic uh, and parts that are sourced and produced and assembled uh, and, you know, in many cases, maintained. Uh, and so then you've got the spectrum in between. Um, 
And this is really where uh, you know the CAD system is going to thrive, and that is is uh, getting you from that that concept art into a more specified product design. Uh, still a lot of creativity, but in 3D. Uh, you need to start developing your proportions and how much volume something takes up. What are your weights? Do you have any uh, your capacities for, especially in various containers and, and other kinds of appliances? Um, lots of rapid variations. Maybe you're settling down on a couple of your, uh, of your favorite concepts, but then you want to explore them a little bit more deeply. You start getting into prototypes, whether it's just you know, digital prototypes uh, or you're printing parts or sending things to model makers and, and really starting to explore and, uh, and zero in on, on you know, a couple primary paths that you're going to take your product. Um, and, then, and then comes the real challenging part. Um, you know, this is where the engineers come in and you have to refine that design. And this is where the, the rubber meets the road and, and you have to start uh, you know, considering how is this going to be manufactured? Um, you know, what, what production um, problems might we encounter? Uh, what production techniques might we use? And you know, then you get really into uh, the specific performance of every individual component of that assembly that you're going to end up shipping. Um, so this is where you're going to you know, leverage your product knowledge of, of whatever industry you operate in and uh, you know, whatever design innovations you're bringing uh, you know, to market. Um, so throughout all of this, okay, that, you know, that's what we have to do on you know, a couple of months cycle here. Um, the challenge always is to just compress this right, as much as we can. Um, that's any time savings means you get to market before your customers. Um, any cost reductions uh, oftentimes are done by taking things on the left on the right hand side here and trying to push them further upstream. Um, you know when when you have a, a really proficient industrial engineer, it's because they do understand uh, the requirements of production and feasibility. Uh, of parts, and so that's going to go into that design up front. Um, the specification is going to start, you know, considering how you're going to manufacture, uh, you know, these different components, what materials and techniques you might be using, uh, and of course, you know, design for manufacture is a is a huge uh, part of consumer products. Anytime you have uh, any sort of volume kind of production, uh, you know, little little adjustments you can make up front in the design. Um, you know, the further uh, ahead you can do that, the more savings you get. Um, so that's the challenge. Uh, what are we going to do about this? Um, I'm going to explore with you uh, in the CAD system uh, this zone right here. This is the one that's most interesting to me um, because it really lives halfway between art and engineering. And this is a zone that, that there's still a lot of untapped um, potential for. Uh, we have many customers that are trying to bridge this gap between the, the artists and the engineers. Um, more and more, uh, your, your pure arts majors are starting to do 3D modeling, sometimes even with a mechanical CAD system. Other times, maybe with some sort of digital uh, computer-generated imagery. Um, more and more, you've got engineers that, that are understanding and learning about uh, styles and you know human factors and perception and things like that. Um, and so this is a zone that I really want to uh, explore with you today. Uh, and we're going to do that through. I'm going to take you through three examples. All right. So, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot the slide. <clears throat> the sum of all this, all right, of those previous slides is uh, we need this to be fast. We need this to be flexible. And we also need to make sure our designs are feasible. So we want to explore lots of different concepts. Uh, we want some flexibility in that exploration, um, especially with various design variations. Uh, and we always need to keep in mind the feasibility of bringing these ideas to production. Um, so we're going to explore these three things uh, through three different examples. Um, I'm going to take you through uh, building a coffee maker from scratch just to bring you through how you can explore those 3D forms. Um, I'm going to take you through 
uh, a design of a remote control, which uh, is really kind of an archetypal example of how you can get from uh, art to part, uh, taking in some concept art and generating some real solids from that and then managing that design. Uh, and then also we'll take a look at the speaker example uh, as a, a more, even more invested way of, uh, of capturing that stylistic aspect uh, through the design of your uh, of your CAD geometry and uh, your production parts. I was going to say that's a ni that's a nice Sunday morning there. Coffee, remote control, speaker. You know what? I didn't even think of that. It's a relaxing Sunday. Or Saturday at least. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so yeah, that's um, <laughs> I'm hungry right now or thirsty right now. Just thinking about it. 